Hello, we welcome nations. This is Ali and I'm joined today by Dr. David Abdul Malik, the uh, postdoc endo resident, uh, junior postdoc endo resident, Harvard School of Dental Medicine postdoc endo program. David, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, David uh, and I are doing the um, uh, the next installment of the endodontic management of the medically compromised patient, and uh, today's topic is the area of antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, David, uh, this is an area that is of great interest to almost all practicing dentists out there. Uh, and I think the area of antibiotics is one area that has changed quite a bit over the, my course of career, which is over 20-some years. Uh, 20 some years ago when I used to sit in your chair, uh, we had patients that we were giving antibiotics for treatment, you know, that had any kind of a set of symptoms, as well as for prophylaxis, if they exhibited any potential sign that could lead into, um, you know, uh, in our estimation at the time of a, uh, of a heart vegetation forming that could cause a uh, acute uh, bacterial endocarditis. But that has all changed. And I think for the better, because we now understand that antibiotics are not candy. They are not just harmless uh, things that you would use just in case, but they actually have great negative consequences. And it's very important that we um, limit their use to when they're exactly indicated. And I think in that sense, the American Heart Association has now had recent changes that we're going to discuss and you're going to uh, bring up to the attention of our viewers. But in this format, what we always do is you just talk about a case of a case that is presented to you. You quickly present that, and then we talk about the uh, the medical uh, component of the case. So, with that said, please uh, present us uh, the, uh, your patient. Thank you. We had a 65-year-old male present to our clinic. The important aspects of his medical history included a penicillin allergy, heart valve replacement two years ago, is currently taking clindamycin and ciprofloxacin for a foot ulcer, and. His dental history included a pulpal exposure during carious excavation of tooth number 31. We decided to give the patient a prescription for azithromycin 500 mg one hour before the procedure and proceeded with non-surgical root canal therapy of tooth number 31. So that's great. I think the case looks beautiful, by the way, uh, but uh, we're going to talk more about the medical history and its implication. You chose to give azithromycin. Uh, the patient had allergies to uh, penicillin, and I think what we need to talk about here is, you know, the culmination of why did you arrive at that decision. But first and foremost, let's talk about some of the uh, indications for the use of um, antibiotic prophylaxis in dentistry. First in endo, I mean, do we really need to uh, use prophylaxis in endodontics? Absolutely. And the reason being, as the ADA has mandated, any dental procedure that involves gingival manipulation or manipulation of the periapical tissue requires antibiotic prophylaxis. This is critical for endodontics as rubber dam isolation often includes gingival manipulation and obtaining and maintaining patency often includes the periapical tissue. Yeah, so basically David, anytime we have uh, potential for bacteremia, we sh a patient in which uh, prophylaxis is indicated should have had prophylaxis and for endodontic therapy because of the manipulation of the gingival during the placement of the rubber dam clamp as well as patency issues is overall something that would be indicated. However, as we were talking about it, these indications have changed. So can you please share with our viewers these current guidelines, the specifically the six important guidelines that the AHA has recommended, and um, you know, uh, who are these patients that need to be prophylaxed? And it's critical to understand that this is a joint understanding between the ADA, the American Dental Association, and the AHA, the American Heart Association. In 2007, they agreed to a collaborated list of patients that require antibiotic prophylaxis. These patients specifically are patients who have had heart valve replacement or implanted artificial material, patients with a history of infective endocarditis, heart transplants that have developed valvulopathies, any unrepaired congenital cyanotic heart defects, any patients with congenital heart defect surgical correction within the last six months, and any patients with corrected heart defects that still show manifestations of the defect. So, uh, that, that, so these are the specific six that are indicated, and um, uh, you know, this obviously a lot less than it used to be. And it's really critical to, to realize that only and only if somebody has had these six indications, according to the AHA and the ADA, that they should be getting prophylaxed, and really for nothing else, right? In fact, what about the joint replacement? Because that's been an area of controversy, and recently the ADA has passed something. Can you share that with our viewers? 
In 2014, the ADA has changed their position on antibiotic prophylaxis for patients who have had joint replacement surgery. It is now understand and is now acceptable that for patients who have had joint replacement, no longer need antibiotic prophylaxis. And um, what about the congenital heart defects? The ADA and the AHA have limited patients that need antibiotic prophylaxis to patients with cyanotic heart defects. This is different than all heart defects, as some heart defects are cyanotic in nature and some are non-cyanotic in nature. Yeah, so that's really the, the critical part about the cyanotic aspect of the, uh, of the defect uh, repair. So let's say that we have a patient that is within those six um, um, criteria uh, on the guideline for antibiotic prophylaxis. What is our medication of choice for somebody who is not allergic to penicillin? Your first go-to medication for patients that require antibiotic prophylaxis is amoxicillin 500 milligrams, four tablets, one hour before the procedure. Yeah, and for many people that nowadays are allergic to penicillin, what do we recommend then? If the patient is unable to take amoxicillin, the practitioner should consider giving the patient clindamycin 150 milligrams, four tablets, one hour before the procedure, or azithromycin 500 milligrams, one hour before the procedure. Okay, that's great, but some people can take pills. I mean, taking a bunch of those uh, thick amoxicillin capsules is something that many people cannot tolerate. For patients who can take uh, medication uh, orally, uh, is there an IM or a parenteral formulation that they could take? If the patient's unable to take oral medication, the practitioner should consider giving ampicillin 2 grams, either intramuscular or intravenous, 30 minutes before the appointment. If the patient's unable to take ampicillin due to an allergy, the practitioner should consider clindamycin 600 milligrams, also intramuscular or intravenous, 30 minutes before the appointment, or cefazolin 1 gram, intramuscular or intravenous, 30 minutes before the procedure. That's terrific. But what about for children? Because children obviously require a different dosage as a result of their size and tolerance. What for patients, for children who are not allergic to penicillin, what would be the recommended dose? For children, because the prescription is based entirely off weight, you would give penicillin 50 milligrams per kilogram, split into four tablets one hour before the procedure. If the patient's unable to take penicillin also due to an allergy, you should consider clindamycin 20 milligrams per kilogram, also four tablets an hour before the procedure, or azithromycin 15 milligrams per kilogram, one hour before the procedure. Again, uh, for those children who cannot take uh, those uh, big pills, what do we recommend uh, for them either uh, intramuscularly or intravenously? For children who are unable to take oral medication, the practitioner should consider ampicillin 50 milligrams per kilogram given intramuscular or intravenously 30 minutes before the appointment. If the patient is allergic to ampicillin, the patient should be given clindamycin 20 milligrams per kilogram, also intramuscular or intravenous 30 minutes before the appointment, or cefazolin, 25 milligrams per kilogram, given intramuscular or intravenous 30 minutes before the appointment. Terrific. So, uh, in this, this actually is part of the reason why you, uh, uh, you had a patient who was allergic to, uh, uh, to penicillin. Um, and can you actually elaborate? So, let's say if somebody is taking already a medication, uh, somebody is allergic to penicillin, or they're already taking it, an antibiotic. What is the what is basically what do you need to do in those patients? When you have a patient present to you who's already on an antibiotic, you should consider giving them an antibiotic from a different class. Also, sometimes patients forget to take their medication before the procedure. It is safe to dispense the antibiotic before the start of the procedure and up to two hours postoperatively per the ADA's recommendation. Also, it's important to understand that sometimes patients are unfamiliar with the medical terminology and may not know what type of heart defect they may have had or what type of heart surgery they may have had. Always consult with the patient's cardiologist if the patient is unsure about their medical history. When in doubt, the practitioner should consider pre-medicating the patient. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I think, first of all, uh, I think the viewers should understand that if a patient has not taken their uh, oral prophylaxis when they come to see you, it doesn't mean that you have to postpone or reschedule the appointment, that they can take it up to two hours after the appointment is uh, completed. It's always a good idea, I would think, that in a dental practice to have some antibiotics of, you know, some penicillin, and for those who are allergic to penicillin, uh, a, a replacement 
on hand for patients who do not happen to have their antibiotic on them or they've forgotten it so that you can actually give it to the patient to take. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think I can't emphasize enough, I mean, we talked about this, David, if in doubt, do prescribe, but I think it's really important to understand that antibiotics are not uh, harmless, that they there is now as the body of knowledge in terms of their effect on the overall microbiome and the role of the microbiome itself is becoming clear in our overall um, health immune system and even in our behavior as the newer research is showing how the microbiome is affecting our overall uh, feeling, you know, of well-being, if you will. Uh, it's important to understand that, you know, we really need to reduce and eliminate the need, uh, the use of antibiotics that has been given unnecessarily to patients. Of course, uh, as of as of the date of this, uh, you know, video, the current guidelines are limited to those six uh, specific indications, and that uh, patients with uh, with joint replacements no longer require them. Um, so it's important to keep these areas in mind. And uh, David, thank you so much for spending the time to share uh, this information with our viewers. And we look forward to seeing more of you here. And uh, uh, for Rio Dendo, I'm Ali Nese, and I was joined by Dr. Uh, David Abdul-Malek, uh, second year endo resident and fellow at Harvard School of Dental Medicine postdoc endo program. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, David.